Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are glad that you are joining he here, us, us, here, whatever the wording is here. We're glad that you are joining us in the online space of The Gathering. And my name is Nick, and uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we'd like to introduce ourselves a little bit. If you don't know who we are, uh, a good way to check us out is by going to our website, everettgathering.com, and you can read up on this very... Well, I kind of feel it's a unique group that you've stumbled onto here. We're actually technically on paper two churches, uh, Zion Lutheran Church and Pathways Church, who come from different backgrounds, traditions, uh, ways of doing things, who have decided to partner together because we have some core values and things that we think are important in common. And we are learning as two different groups, uh, to learning how to love one another, learning how to meet each other where we are, learning our traditions and sacred uh, moments together, and it's been great for us to learn how to exist with one another. And so, if you want to learn a little bit more about us, um, check us out on the website there. I think you'll appreciate the core values. Uh, we usually, though, like to introduce ourselves with a couple words, just as a, <clears throat> I guess, a brief snapshot of who we are. Uh, the first word uh, these two groups together uh, we use is cautious. We're a group that's a little cautious about organized religion. Uh, many of us have found ourselves in this group because we have... Uh, been around religion growing up, and we've seen religion, of course, used in ways that's helpful and beneficial and positive and generous. Uh, but many of us have also seen religion used in some ways that's harmful, exclusive, uh, toxic. And some of us uh, ourselves or some of our family or friends have been harmed a great deal by religion. And so we know that religion can be very dangerous. And so we find ourselves a little cautious about organized religion, which is weird. I mean, we're organized in like three different ways. Uh, we're organized separately as two different churches and then uh, together as this gathering. So we are a uh, sort of at least loosely organized group of religious people, also a little skeptical of organized religion. But we think that's actually a healthy tension to hold. Uh, the second thing we use to describe ourselves is the word curious. We are a group that likes to ask a lot of questions. And each week I mention that it's okay to ask questions here. In fact, uh, I'll be talking a little bit later. I'd love to have you ask some questions. You can text them in if you'd like to do that or in the comments as you're watching on the live stream here. Uh, but uh, we like to ask a lot of questions about things we don't know. But most, more fundamentally, we like to ask a lot of questions in this group about things we think we already know the answers to. Because it turns out that's where a lot of our blind spots hide. That there are ways of thinking or believing that have been passed down to us. And we like to ask questions of those things because perhaps we've never fully investigated it for ourselves. And it turns out that some of these ways of thinking and believing that have been handed down to us, uh, some of them aren't working for us today. Maybe some of them never really were working, uh, but we like to ask questions about those things and perhaps rethink them. So if either of those two words connects with you, uh, this might be a pretty good group for you to learn a little bit more about. Now, uh, here in this space for the next few moments, we're going to be doing an online worship service, basically. So our worship leader, Billy, he's going to come on the screen and he's going to sing uh, two songs. And in between is a little reflective video. Uh, this one, I believe, is about the cross because that's what we're going to be talking about today. And after we spend a couple moments singing together, then uh, I'll come back on the screen and we have a message today as I was just uh, explaining about the cross. What's happening at the cross? Why is it that Jesus has to die? What does that accomplish, actually? Uh, so we're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. And then after that, we will wrap up with a time of communion. Now, in our in-person gatherings, we take communion as a group together every week. And we supply the items that you will need for that. But in the online space, you'll need to provide a couple things for yourself if you'd like to participate. Uh, what we you'll need is you'll just need something that represents uh, the bread, which could be a little chunk of bread or a cracker. And you'll need something that represents the cup, maybe a little bit of juice or some wine left over from last night's dinner. All you got to do is break those things out. And at the end of our time, uh, Billy will lead us in another song and we can go to the communion. And you can remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus there uh, if you would like. And then we'll wrap up the whole thing here with some announcements. Okay, that's where we're going. Can't wait to get into this series. I really think you're going to like it. A lot of us have had some ideas of what is going on at the cross. Not all of them have been flattering uh, to God. And so we're going to discuss over the next few weeks uh, some new ways that are actually old ways of thinking about what is happening at the cross. But before we get there, why don't we get to some music. Billy, take it away, and I'll see you back here on the screen in just a little bit.
It was designed to punish. It was created to kill. It was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill. It was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat, to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. This is the cross. Cause I 
Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I'll sing out, remind my soul that I am yours. I am forever yours. Cause love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I'll sing. All right, let's get to it today. Have you ever noticed that how you tell a story really matters? I mean, depending on who is telling the story, how they tell it, and what parts of the story they find important or want to really emphasize, I mean, the story can change quite a bit. An event that was in reality actually very scary can be told in a way that isn't scary at all. And a moment that was really beautiful can be told in a way that seems absolutely horrible. It's all in the framing and the telling of the story. For instance, a few years back, my family and I, we went to Disneyland. And I mean, you know Disneyland, right? I mean, it's a magical place. They say it's the happiest place on earth. And it was lots of fun. My kids were little at the time, so the whole place was just magic to them. And there's so much fun to be had. Characters that they love from movies, rides, the food, the fireworks at night, and the parade. I mean, we had a blast. It was an incredible time. It was an absolutely great week that we spent down there uh, going to Disneyland. And anybody in our family would tell you that it was just a thrilling, absolutely amazing week. But I could tell the story another way. I could tell the story of a family on a forced march of seven to eight miles per day, walking in the hot sun, our sun, our skin sizzled by the sun, our feet hurt, and we were often trudging along, our bodies suffering from a lack of water. I could tell the story of a family that was taken advantage of by food providers, only allowed food from certain merchants, charged outrageous prices, and given food with poor nutritional value. I could tell a story of how every day took every bit of energy that we had, that we fell asleep early each night in an unfamiliar place, crammed into a little room, kept awake by our son's snoring. And I could tell you a story of how when we all arrived home, we were grateful that we finally got to sleep in our own beds. Now, of course, all of these things have some truth in them, but to tell the story that way would not be fair to the experience of the trip. You see, depending on how you want to tell a story, you can take some real aspects of the story and emphasize them and convey an overall picture that doesn't convey the main beauty of the story. And I want to suggest today that maybe our story of the cross has been that way for us. That the way of telling the story that we're familiar with may have distorted a few things that seems to tell the story in a way that is less than flattering. Now, often in our culture and all time, 
The story of the cross has been told in a way that seems much less beautiful, much less like good news, than the way perhaps it was heard by the first Christians and the way that they saw it. There's a way of telling the story of the cross today that makes God seem violent, angry, and frankly, almost abusive. There's a way of telling the story that we're familiar with today that almost reinforces a fear of God rather than leading us into his arms with trust. And this way of telling the story of the cross has become so familiar to many of us that we can't even imagine telling it any other way. Now we're doing a series, we're calling it Atonement, and it's a short little four-week deal on we're going to look at what is happening at the cross, because that's really what atonement is all about. What is happening at the cross? What's really happening there? What about Jesus dying on a cross actually saves us? How does that work? And how we answer the questions of atonement, well, it goes a really long way in how we think about God and his character. What we think about what is happening at the cross goes a long way to explaining for us what God is actually like. Because atonement theories and views of God are intimately related. Now, let me give you a little example of this because <clears throat> this example here is the thing that probably kicks off the way that we think of the cross, the, the story that many of us have been told about the cross. It's sort of the event that kicks off that view in our culture. Uh, there was a sermon, probably the most famous sermon ever in American history. It was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preached by a man named Jonathan Edwards. It's a Puritan classic, and he preached this sermon on July 9th, 1741. And some people say that this sermon actually started the Great Awakening in America. Now, this sermon is the most famous sermon probably in American history, but it's pretty rough. It depicts humans as very sinful and God as extremely angry with them. And the whole idea of the sermon was to provoke people to turn to God. And so let me share with you one of the most famous sections of this sermon. Jonathan Edwards preached this. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect, over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. Oh, he is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. <laughs> wow. Cheery sermon, huh? It's a picture of a God who cannot even bear being around humans who are so obviously flawed. And Jonathan Edwards says that he sadistically holds us like a spider over a fire, eager to punish us. And what is Jonathan Edwards' solution? Well, his solution is Jesus. That God hates us so much. But God pours out all of his anger and hatred at human perfection on Jesus and tortures him like he wants to do to us and kills him like we deserve. And that when this happens, his wrath and his anger and his vengeance is satisfied. And the message of Jonathan Edwards is that God hates you, but he will accept Jesus as a substitute, taking his wrath out on Jesus changes God's mind about you. And so Jonathan Edwards' hope is that you will turn to Jesus and be saved. Now, Jonathan Edwards can only preach this sermon because of how he views the meaning of the cross. And his sermon here is responsible for how popular that view of the cross became in our culture today. But is it the best way to tell the story? How did people think about the cross before 1741. Now, in this series, I want to share some things with you that I believe are happening at the cross. Some things that I think are more useful, more helpful, and if I might be so bold, accurate to what is happening at the cross. And I'm really excited to share them because I think this can be hugely transformational for some of us. Some of us really need some new ways to see the cross. 
And next week, we're going to jump into that. We're going to see some new ways of thinking about the cross that are actually very old ways. And I'm tempted to skip right into that this week because it's really exciting when we begin to unpack the cross and see it telling a different story than perhaps we've ever been told before. But first, I want us to slow down and look head on at this angry God version of the cross that many of us are accustomed to. It is so familiar and it is so from from us for many of us it's the most it's the only way we know of telling the story of the cross. And so I think it's helpful for us to slow down and see how it came about and why it might not be the best way to tell the story. Now this way of viewing the cross, it has a name, so let's go ahead and name it, and it is the Penal Substitutionary Atonement Theory. Now this is just a fancy name given to this angry God version, (laughs) this way of telling the story of the cross. Now there's several ways to tell it. Some people use this theory to really play up the angry God, uh, as Jonathan Edwards did, and for others it's a little more subtle, but if we take it to its logical conclusions, we notice some of the same problems. But let's unpack it a little bit here word by word. First of all, penal. Penal just means punishment. It's the picture of a courtroom with God as judge and humans on trial as moral offenders. And in this way of thinking about things, God sees all of humanity as having sinned and thus guilty and needing punishment. That uh, guilt always requires punishment punishment that God is just and therefore he will punish any sin. And so in some senses, uh, in this picture of how God and the cosmos works, God's hands are kind of tied. I mean, God is just and justice demands punishment. And so God kind of can't let you off the hook. He has to punish you, which should bring up some questions in this theory of who is really God. Uh, Is it Yahweh, God himself, or is it this idea of justice? Now, for many, this punishment is not simply death, but actually it's torture for all eternity. That is what humankind deserves for being flawed and sinning. Which brings up some other questions, right? I mean, we have an eternal punishment for a finite mistake. It appears that the, uh, that the uh, punishment here doesn't fit the crime. But nevertheless, the idea here is that there has been a crime that has occurred in all of humanity that every person is guilty of and deserves punishment. Now the second word here is substitutionary. And this just means that there is a substitute for the punishment. Jesus is the substitute. Jesus steps up, lives a perfect life and says, you know what, here's the deal. I'll take the human's place, punish me instead. And so the cross is Jesus taking our punishment. God punishes Jesus in order to satisfy justice. And so in this way of thinking, God doesn't forgive so much as he accepts payment or punishment from a different source. And then, of course, the last word is atonement. And atonement is just a way of making things right. It's the idea, in some sense, of reparations, perhaps, but it's something done to repair a relationship. And so the idea here is that Jesus satisfies God's anger and his wrath and his need for punishment of sin, and that then allows us to go free. And so our relationship with God is then restored as long as we believe that Jesus did this for us and confess it with our mouth and they are, and then we are baptized. And when that happens, that Jesus clothes us so that when God sees us, he doesn't see us, he sees Jesus instead of us and then no longer punishes us. Okay, so that is the predominant view uh, really of our world today. So let me give you a little bit of uh, a PSA, public service announcement, on PSA, the Penal Substitutionary Atonement. Okay, a little public service announcement. Let's just take a look at this whole thing, and I'm going to go kind of quick through it, all right? Uh, But I want you to see a couple things about this way of thinking. It's probably a way of the cross that you are somewhat familiar with, even if I'm exaggerating how you've heard it understood. Uh, It's probably a way of understanding the cross that you are familiar with, And there's a couple things about it that you should probably know before we get into this whole thing. And the first is this, that it is the predominant view of Western, of the Western church today. Now, most of us grew up thinking about the cross in some manner, like the way I just described it. We heard sermons about it. We even sang songs with it. In fact, we sing one sometimes in in our church gathering, although we've changed the lyrics a little bit and how we sing it. But the original lyric of a song that we often sing, Christ Alone, has a lyric that says, And at the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God 
was satisfied. Okay? I mean, it's a popular song in the church today, and the phrasing is right there, the picture of this cross of angry God who is satisfied by the punishment of Jesus. And some of us didn't even realize that there were other ways of thinking about the cross. We just take it for, uh, for granted that this must be what the cross means. Which brings me to the second thing we should know about PSA, the Penal Substitutionary Atonement, and that is that it is actually a minority view in all of church history. Now, it might be surprising to know that this is actually a minority view in the 2,000 years since Jesus actually went to the cross. It's actually mostly a Protestant, which means non-Catholic way, of telling the story. Catholics today and Eastern Orthodox believers tell the story a very different way. In fact, Eastern Orthodox people tell the story not of uh, punishment, but that they say the story of the cross isn't about punishment, it's about healing. They call it recapitulation theory. And the picture here is not of a courtroom, uh, the way that maybe you are familiar with. It's actually the picture of a hospital. That we go into a hospital and humans are sick and dying. And of course, they would say humans sin. We all do. Uh, but the punishment for that is sort of inherent. It's not that God has to impose it. It's that when we sin, it makes us sick and it destroys our lives. And so we don't need punishment. What we need is healing. And so Jesus, in his own incarnation, becomes human. And in becoming human, he then lives a perfect life in order to fulfill what we couldn't fulfill. And then by doing that, he actually heals in us what is broken. And so he goes all the way to death and dies and triumphs over it. And when he triumphs over it, he is conquering it in order to heal us. And so the picture is not of punishment, but of healing. As Isaiah said, by his stripes, we are healed. So that is the way one large section of Christianity even thinks still today. There's another part of uh, Christianity that believes something different, the Catholic Church. And they have another idea, but it is sort of associated with the PSA. And it came from a man named Anselm. Anselm in 1099 AD or CE uh, he came up with something called the satisfaction theory. And it's kind of maybe the origins of PSA. It's not exactly PSA because punishment was not part of Anselm's theory. But Anselm said that he believed that human sin robbed God of the honor that he was due. And so Jesus lives a perfect life and dies restoring God's honor or satisfying it. And it's still the predominant Catholic view today. But you could say that perhaps it is the seed of origin here in the idea of PSA, but that doesn't even come around till 1099 AD. So for half of the time of uh, Christianity, it does not exist. Now, here's another thing you should know about the PSA, the Penal Substitutionary Atonement. See, I'm glad I have an acronym because that is just a mouthful to say. And that is uh, that there was a pivotal moment where this began to get a little bit of traction, and that was during the Reformation period. Now, the PSA gained strength in Christianity in the 1500s, okay? We're only talking about 500 years ago. And it was born out of the 16th century Reformation. The Catholic Church at this time was the political power of Europe, and there were all sorts of teachings how to keep the power associated within the Catholic Church. And so, of course, you remember the key pivotal character of the Reformation, Martin Luther. All the Lutherans listen to this, love this, right? Martin Luther was the reformer. He saw there were some problems with the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. He didn't want to start his own uh, sect of Christianity, by the way, <laughs> like Lutheranism. <laughs> that wasn't actually his goal. Other people did that. Um, but he just wanted to reform the Catholic Church. And really, the reformers in his day had two problems with Catholic teaching. One was purgatory. The Catholics believed that there was a place that when people died, their souls would go before heaven. They would be caught in this in-between place called purgatory. And what would happen there is they would either be tortured or punished until they were ready for heaven. And the church was selling these things they called indulgences to get people out early. So if you had a family member who died and you were afraid they were in purgatory, you could make a nice contribution to your local Catholic church and they would sell you an indulgence, which meant, hey, your uh, family member gets a get out of jail free card. They can now head on up out of purgatory into heaven. 
And uh, the reformers saw this as corruption. There was no biblical base for, basis for this. They saw it as just a way to milk people out of money. And so the reformers highlighted Jesus as the one who was punished as a transaction for our sin to counter the need for people needing to be pu uh, punished in purgatory. You see? There's a reason for why they highlighted the punishment of Jesus. The second reason was because of Mass. Now, Mass wasn't just a church service in this day. Uh, when the priest got the communion elements ready, they were supposedly making the sacrifice of Jesus present all over again. In other words, the bread actually became the body of Jesus, and the cup actually became the blood of Jesus. And so what would happen in Catholic ways of thinking is that every time you take communion, there is a fresh sacrifice for the sins that you committed this past week since the last time that you took communion. And the reformers, again, saw this as another power grab, a way to keep people coming back over and over and over again. And they insisted that Jesus was the sacrifice punished once and for all. And so this idea of PSA caught on here in the Reformation as a way to combat the corruption that the Reformers saw in Catholicism. Now, interestingly, Luther doesn't seem to believe in the atonement in a PSA way. He seems to see it more in the Catholic view of satisfaction, which that makes sense, he was Catholic, and a little bit in the way of the Eastern Orthodox as well. Uh, really, another man named John Calvin runs with it after Martin Luther and ushers in the PSA as we sort of know it today. But it only really becomes popular until that crazy sermon that I just read with Jonathan Edwards in 1741, which means this has really only been on the scene in our popular minds for the last 250 years. Now, there's another thing you should know about the PSA, and that is that it appears to really misunderstand the purpose or even the significance of Old Testament sacrifice. Now, one of the biggest problems with the PSA telling of the story of the cross is its understanding of sacrifice. Of course, there are sacrifices in the Bible, and of course, the Bible uses language of Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. But Jesus, in this way of thinking about the cross, is painted as a necessary sacrifice which appeases a wrathful or angry God. And the problem is, that is just not how Old Testament sacrifice worked. Old Testament sacrifice was not about punishing animals to let humans go free. Old Testament sacrifices were not about appeasing the wrath of God at all. And there's a lot that we could say on this. We could do a whole sermon series or a whole sermon or two on the purpose of Old Testament sacrifice. But let's just look at the most famous sacrifice that the Bible uses to describe Jesus. And that is the idea of a Passover lamb, a Passover lamb sacrifice. Jesus is described that way in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Okay, so we are referencing an Old Testament sacrifice here, the Passover lamb, which is probably the most famous Old Testament sacrifice. And you have to remember this story, right? Israel is enslaved in Egypt and Moses shows up, and he's trying to get Pharaoh to let the people go, and he doesn't want to, and so Moses brings all these plagues, right? God working through Moses to bring all these plagues, and then uh, Moses, or Pharaoh still won't let him go, but there's the final plague. It's the death of the firstborn, and the Israelites are told, before this happens, to go out and kill a lamb, and then paint the doorposts of their house with blood, and then eat the rest of the lamb as a sort of Passover meal. But and then what happens is during the plague, uh, the destroyer passes over their houses with blood and doesn't kill their firstborn, but all the firstborn in Egypt die. Okay? It's the most famous sacrifice story, I suppose, in the Old Testament. And Jesus is related to the Passover sacrifice. But notice a few things about this sacrifice. This story is not about appeasing an angry God who is mad about sin, right? Uh, the Israelites haven't sinned at all. They're just slaves. And this has nothing to do with them. The lamb is not killed because the Israelites sinned. The sacrifice here is a sacrifice of protection and then is incorporated into a meal of remembrance. You see what I'm saying here? Now, much of the Old Testament says that God doesn't even want sacrifice, let alone need it. Excellent example here, Psalm 51. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. 
You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is instead a broken spirit, a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Okay? So we have the psalmist here saying, I know you don't even want a sacrifice. You'd rather see a change in my life. And we have lots of other verses in the Old Testament that vocalize this as well. As well. Micah 6, 8, Hosea 6, 6 say similar things. That God doesn't need or want a sacrifice of an animal. He doesn't need the blood of an animal. What he really is after is right action, upright living, connection and humility before God. What's more, in the Old Testament, and really in the New Testament too, it's pretty clear that God doesn't actually need an animal sacrifice or blood to forgive. Now, there's a lot of examples of this, and we could go through a bunch of them, but here's one of the most famous ones, that is Jonah. Remember, God sends Jonah to Nineveh to tell them, in 40 days, your whole city is going to be destroyed. And the people of Nineveh, they believe Jonah. And here's what happens in Jonah 3, verse 10. It says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and not did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Okay? God doesn't need a sacrifice in order to forgive them. He just needs them to repent and turn from their ways. And in fact, we have instructions like this to the people in the Old Testament as well, to the Israelite people. Famous verse, 2 Chronicles 7:14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Noticeably missing from here is if they will offer a sacrifice of blood so that I can forgive them, right? That's not there at all. God tells his people he will forgive them if they change their ways. There's no animal sacrifice needed. Now, The writer of Hebrews in the New Testament also tells us that blood sacrifices never even had the power to cancel sin. I mean, maybe you've never recognized this before, but look at this. Hebrews 10, verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. (laughs) Here's the author of Hebrews telling you, you know all those Old Testament sacrifices? They didn't take away anybody's sins. Verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You see, if we believe that God needs a blood sacrifice to forgive sins, the writer of Hebrews would like to have a word. Now, it appears that sacrifice is even only a part of Israelites' worship experience because God caught them making these sacrifices to other uh, gods and was repurposing them to himself. Uh, Leviticus 17, verse 6 and 7, we have God um, who's been talking to the people and says, The priest is to splash the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting and burn the fat as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them and for the generations to come. What we seem to be uh, discovering here is that the people, before they interact and come into covenant with God, they have been making sacrifices to all sorts of pagan gods because pagan gods did demand sacrifices in order to appease them or to manipulate them. And the people have been doing this to apparently some sort of goat idols. And Yahweh says, okay, enough with that. Let's move you off of offering sacrifices to these false idols. And let's just repurpose that so you're sacrificing them to me. It's like he's trying to wean them off of this whole idea of sacrifice in the first place. It's not as though he needs it. He's just trying to repurpose it to move them along. You get it? You see, it's important to understand that there are lots of things that the Old Testament sacrifices are for. But what it's not about is punishing something else as a substitute for the sin of the people. Now that's the Old Testament, but the problem with the PSA is that it also tends to warp the New Testament witness of who killed Jesus. Because the PSA way of telling the story really tells the story of God demanding punishment and taking it out on Jesus. His innocent blood covers us so that he doesn't see us anymore. And in this story, God really needs Jesus to die. It's the only way to make things right again. And so, yes, humans put Jesus up on a cross, but in the telling of the story, it's God who killed Jesus because God needs to take out the vengeance 
on Jesus. He needed him to die, and so he sent him to earth in order to die. And the thing is, that's just not how the New Testament tells the story. The New Testament doesn't say that God killed Jesus. It says we as humans did. Now, quickly, in the book of Acts, there's over a dozen examples of a gospel presentation, and none of them tell the story the way of the PSA. In fact, when we look at the pattern uh, when the apostle Peter preaches the gospel, we notice the role that God plays and the role that humans play. Look at this, Acts 2, verses 23 and 24. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Okay, you, people, humans. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Okay, notice who's responsible here. Who killed Jesus? The people. What was God responsible for? Raising him. Notice the same pattern here in Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all Israel be sure of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Okay? People crucified him. God vindicated him. Acts 3, verse 15. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Acts 4, verse 10. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Acts 5, thir- uh, 5.30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Acts 10, verse 39 to 40, they killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and has caused him to be seen. You notice the pattern there? Who is responsible for what? It's very important to see in the story here. This is how the first century Christians told the story. God didn't kill Jesus. We did. We are responsible for killing the Christ. God intervened by raising him from the dead. Former preacher Bruxy Cavey, he said it this way. There is a wrath displayed in the crucifying of Christ, but it is ours not God's. When we look at the cross, we see our wrathful rejection of God and his unhindered love for us. The earliest gospel preachers and the writers of scripture never described God pouring out his wrath upon Christ on the cross. You get it? See, the New Testament says, we killed Jesus. And God raised him from the dead. But if we end up telling the story a certain way, we end up getting the story wrong and we end up blaming God rather than ourselves. And that leads me to the sort of last thing I want to start us out with here about this way of viewing the story of the cross. And that is that the PSA, it really maligns the character of God himself. Because when you take Jonathan Edwards and his sermon and his way of thinking about the cross to its conclusion, this penal substitutionary atonement theory makes God out to be, well, kind of a monster, a sadistic child abuser, a father who would torture his own son, a God who hates humanity, who is angry, and will only forgive them, not even, not even really forgive them, will just take out the punishment on another person, and it almost feels like then begrudgingly except us. And when told this way, the story of the cross is no longer beautiful, but sort of horrific. Doesn't seem like very good news. The God hates us, but will tolerate us if he can punish someone else in our place. I mean, would you trust someone like that? Atonement is the word that we use here for the cross. But what atonement really means is the reconciliation of a relationship, the healing of a relationship. It really means at one meant. That's the best way to understand the word atonement is at one meant. It's the idea of how do humans and God become at one, together, restored in relationship. And the PSA way of telling the story tells us that we need the cross to change God's mind about 
us. But I don't think that's the best way of telling the story. I think the New Testament gives us a better way of telling the story. The cross doesn't change God's mind about us. The cross changes our mind about God. That ever since the garden, humans have believed that God cannot be trusted. That when the serpent came and said, oh, you're not supposed to eat that fruit. I mean, I mean, did God really say that if you eat it, you will die? That the whole thing that starts this off is the seed of mistrust in God's character. And because of our mistrust, we've gone our own way and we've screwed things up. And God has never abandoned us, but we have abandoned him because we were mistrustful of him. And to bring us back to at one meant God needs to demonstrate that the way that we've been going is killing us. He needs to expose the way of greed and power over and our own working and grasping and holding on to power and selfishness. He needs to expose that as something that is actually tearing us apart and killing us. And then he needs to reveal to us what he is really like, that he is good and trustworthy and that we can uh, reach into his arms and that he will love us and knows what's best for us and that finally he will invite us into a way that will transform our pain into something beautiful. And that is what our telling of the story of the next few weeks is going to highlight. That the cross is a story exposing empire and power, revealing what God is like and his goodness and inviting us to participate in a way of transformation that will simply change everything about us. Those are the three big categories I hope will change how we think about what Jesus did at the cross. And it's my hope over the next few weeks that we will discover a God more beautiful than we have ever imagined as we recover some ancient ways of thinking about God that move us deeper into his love. We're going to go to communion now, and we're going to celebrate the love of God. As we go there, we don't need to go as fearful people, worried that God hates us, but has provided a sacrifice to, I guess, like us in some manner after all. No, no. Communion is about remembering that God became one of us, that he lived like one of us and allowed all of the greed and the violence and the selfishness that we had sown into the world to rebound onto him and that it killed him, that ultimately we did by the way that we lived life, that he came to bring about justice and distributive justice and love and that because of us going off in our own way, we could not tolerate it and we put him up on a cross, but that he would not stay dead, that he came back to life to triumph over it, to show us a new way that if only we would live into it, our lives could be completely changed. And so we go to the table today thinking about that, amazed by that story and wanting to live into it. We're going to go to communion. Billy's going to lead us in a song here. And if you've got those elements, you can take communion. But let me pray for us before we go. God, we... We come to you today and we're asking for some help over the next few weeks. We really want to see who you are, God. We want to know more about you. We want to help. We want to know a little bit more about what is happening at the cross. And God, we've been had had down. We've had some things handed down to us, some ways of thinking about the cross or believing about the cross that um, maybe don't work for us. Maybe they never did, and we need to rethink them. And we ask for your help over the next four weeks as we do that. Um, Jesus, we trust you. Um, we want to live like you. We want to be taught by you. And so as we go throughout the next three weeks, we pray that you would be our sponsor. As we go through the Bible text, that you would show us the mystery of the cross through who you are. We love you. We thank you that you love us so deeply. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to go to communion here. And then after that's done, we'll come back for some announcements.
I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing that again. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God, yeah, yeah. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after Running out to me, and my life lay down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Running after me with my life laid down, surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing All my life you have been And all my life you have been so, so good You are with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God And I will sing of the goodness of God
That's great, Billy. Thanks so much for that. A couple announcements here as we are wrapping up today. First of all, the gathering does meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, we meet at the Zion Lutheran Church property, which is right near Forest Park in Everett. And it is a really fun time. And I know some of you live too far away to visit us in person. But you, if you ever are around and able to come visit us in person, I'd encourage it because it is a really fun thing to see these two groups coming together. It's sort of hard to replicate that here online. Uh, and so you're invited anytime to be with us in person. If you want to keep up to date on what is happening, you can follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. And uh, we will constantly be posting things that are happening on there. And it's a great way to keep up to date. Just follow us on any of those socials. Uh, tonight, uh, student ministry, they are not meeting downstairs. Uh, there is no student ministry tonight. I know it says that on the screen here, but there was a last minute cancellation due to some sickness stuff. So uh, they will not be meeting at all today. But on Tuesday, uh, there is uh, a synod-wide Bible study that is happening from 7 to 8 p.m. Happens every week. Uh, we post this every week. Just uh, every week, just in case you would like uh, to be a part of it, you can go to the Zoom link there that is at the bottom, uh, take a screenshot of that, and then copy and paste it in your browser window. And uh, you can join uh, this particular Bible study. It just goes from 7 to 8 p.m. It's really well done. Uh, it's only the hour to keep right to it. And it's a great way to meet some people all around the Puget Sound region and have a discussion if you would like to do that. Another opportunity for discussion, uh, discussion is this Thursday night. Theology Pub is meeting. Uh, we are meeting at 6.30 p.m. at the Independent Beer Bar, which is in downtown Everett. Uh, we're going to be bringing in a little bit of pizza to share with one another and just having a time, uh, having a discussion here a little bit about atonement, actually. And so that will be fun, and you are invited to join us in that. Uh, lastly, I uh, want to recommend a book to you for the Easter season. Uh, man, I read this book, I don't know, 15 years ago or whenever it came out, uh, The Last Week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. It's just the best book I've ever read on the events that lead up to Easter. Uh, the book takes every day of the week of the final week of Jesus, uh, Monday through Sunday, and just as, well, actually Sunday to Sunday, describing all the events that are happening, why it matters, why it leads to Jesus' death. It's just the best little book you could read. Uh, one day you can take each chapter or start it now. It's just a fantastic book. You can pick it up on Amazon for 10 bucks, something like that. Uh, so you should look it up and uh, just a book recommendation there as you get ready for Easter. Uh, if you want to follow along with more uh, announcements and things that are happening, you can join our email newsletter. Uh, just message us on Facebook with your name and email address or email me. My email's on the screen there and I'd be happy to add you to the list as well. Uh, if you want to donate financially, you can do that on our website at everettgathering.com slash donate. That's the easiest way to give online. You can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift, and uh, we appreciate so many of you who are doing that. Okay, I think that is everything for today. You know, we're getting into the Easter time frame. March Madness is happening soon. Uh, we'll have an announcement about that next week because we'll be signing up for March Madness brackets and competing in that again too. So just a lot going on this time of year. Uh, in the Puget Sound area this week, it's supposed to be maybe in the 60s and sunny by the weekend. So, I mean, amazing. We're almost to spring. So anyway, hope you have a great week. Uh, hope you have a chance to uh, really get outside and appreciate that. And we will see you next week right here as we begin to talk about some new ways of understanding the cross. Okay, we'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye.